pretty picture of a curlew? We can. Great, right. Well, thanks very much. Um, thanks to Mary and Russ for, for inviting me to talk. Um, really great to see uh, we're almost touching 150 people. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm going to focus on curlews in the lowlands. Um, and I'll come on to kind of what, why they matter in a moment. Um, I'm a researcher and I, and I guess I'll, I'll focus a little bit on some of, the, some of the stuff we don't know as well as some of the stuff we do know about curlews. In the lowlands and, and what we're going to do to try and help them both with action and with more research. Um, so I'm kind of speaking I guess yeah as partly as a, as a member of the Curlew Forum, partly as an employee of WWT and partly as a, a, a member of the steering group for the Curlew Recovery Partnership. So uh, this is a map purloined from the BTO's atlas and it's the 10 kilometer squares where curlews were definitely or probably breeding um, in the last atlas, so that's about 10 years ago now. Um, but uh, if you then kind of mask out all the, oh, well, the Welsh bits, because um, I'm afraid the, the Curd Recovery Partnership for now is English, uh, and you mask out the uplands, you end up with those pink squares. And the point here is that they're the lowlands, that's where curlews breed in the lowlands. And the point here is that we know that the vast majority of curlews by number nest in the uplands of, in the English case of Northern England. Um, but actually a really large part of the range of curlews in England is in the lowlands. We also know that the decline has been fastest, continues to be fastest in many of these lowland sites. And we also know that, that actually a lot of people live in the lowlands. And so when we talk about curlews being this wonderful thing that people can experience in their lives and uh, it makes people happy. Um, the curlews in the lowlands are the ones that more people experience. So, so there's a great deal of value in lowland curlews and they face some particularly acute problems. So here's, here's the same sort of map with the uplands massed out as grey blobs and then the grey squares are lowland curlew areas. And the area I, I've grown to know reasonably well in the last few years through particularly through the curlew forum are the Southern English populations, which I've highlighted here. So there's sort of 10 or so, I mean, you can draw the boundaries in various different ways. Um, some of them are um, moderately big. So there's probably, you know, a hundred odd pairs, I would say in the sort of Shropshire, going down into Herefordshire, maybe up into Cheshire a bit. Um, as Sam was pointing out, there's probably over a hundred pairs, well over a hundred pairs in the Brex. Um, some of them are sort of moderate, or, you know, it's kind of pretty small, really. So we have, you know, 35 pairs in the Seven Vale. Uh, Somerset Levels, I think, is down at 20 pairs. New Forest, 40 pairs. Uh, then you have some really, really tiny populations which are hanging on by a thread in the Berkshire Downs, in Salisbury Plain, uh, Braden Forest in North Wiltshire, and also one or two that aren't shown on this map because they're kind of uplands, but they're not upland. Well, they're, they're in the South Dartmoor and Exmoor, down to the last few pairs. So. All in all, there are only a few hundred pairs. We don't really know exactly how many in Southern English lowlands um, and things are looking quite bad. The other thing about this map, of course, is look at those Northern lowland areas. So curlews in, in sort of Rutland area, curlews in the, uh, Lincolnshire Wolds, the Vale of Pickering, the Vale of York, um, up around Pennine Fringes, the Solway Coast. Um, I don't know much about them. I, I suspect there's plenty of people who care deeply about those birds. And so hopefully we can start to mobilize to help those as well. Um, one little um, black swan in all this that I should mention, this is a map, the little red dots there are airfields. They are the airfields of Britain, or England rather, and um, it turns out that curlews really like airfields, um, probably because they're kind of big, open, unimproved, undisturbed places, grassland places. Um, they quite often they have sort of de facto predator fences because they've got blooming great fences to keep um, naughty people out. Um, and we've discovered literally just in the last three, four years, just how many curlews potentially are on English airfields. And it's a real important area of, of new research to try and find out how many there are, where they are and what they're doing. And it's something that Sam and BTO are, are leading on right now. So we've kind of talked a little bit before, so I'll, I'll kind of whiz through this, but what's gone wrong for curlews in the lowlands? And I guess sort of 
we know the problem is low productivity, right? So they're surviving okay. Survival of adult curlews and curlews once they've fledged has not really changed in recent decades. What's dropped is productivity, it's breeding success. And the problems that Mary and Sam have both mentioned, they apply in spades to the lowlands. So we've got this intensification of grassland management in particular. Here is your kind of ryegrass um, monoculture. Um, it is drained, fertilized, reseeded. Um, it therefore provides rather little insect food, um, not much cover, very dense uh, grassland that chicks can't move through. Lots of reasons why this is not very good habitat for curlews. The conversion of, of um, sort of unimproved, semi-improved grassland to improved grassland in the lowlands of England has kind of, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an event that's run its course by and large. And in most of these places that they got converted in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, there isn't a lot, uh, this isn't getting a lot worse, but curlews are still declining pretty fast in a lot of these places. So what else is happening? Well, again, in these grassland areas in the lowlands, um, the particular problem is, is grass cutting. Um, so, you know, back in the day, hay cuts in late summer, single hay cut in late summer, curlews had plenty of time to nest and fledge chicks. Nowadays, a good silage field, they can be, um, they can be cutting head grass in late April. I suspect they rather won't be this year, um, but they can cut grass from late April, early May, and they can be making two, three, four cuts per year. And that means curlews just do not have time to, to nest and rear chicks successfully without the, the mowing machines doing their damage. Now, you know, should stress there are very good agronomic reasons why farmers do this. Um, and they are responding to a, a, an economic model that society created, the farmers didn't create it, an economic model which creates lots of cheap food for those of us who shop in supermarkets. But the result has been a pretty unfriendly modern landscape for curlews. And the final problem, again, uh, we, we've talked about it before, um, predation, unsustainable rates of predation. So here we're talking about, we're talking about native predators, we're talking about a natural process of predation. Waders get predated. That's what happens to nesting waders. It's perfectly normal. The problem we've got is it's reached unsustainably high levels and we have all these generalist predators. So what, what can we do and, and what are we doing? There is, as I'm sure many of you are aware, and in fact, many of you are the, the protagonists of this, there is a lot of inspiring local curly work going on. And of course, if you, if you kind of want to get right down to the nitty gritty, right down to protecting pairs of curlews, you've got to find your curlew, uh, and preferably you've got to find its nest. And this is something that, that um, Mandy, or I think Mandy's talking later at Curlew Country, they've kind of um, had spectacular success at this. Harry Ewing over in the Brex has also been spectacularly successful. But once you've found nests, you can start talking to farmers about what can you do to help? Can you delay cutting in that patch? Um, that sort of thing. Can you leave this field for a few more weeks? And we found in the Seven Vale, where we have a, a WWT and Gloucester Naturalist Society project, we've had you know phenomenal responses from farmers, incredible enthusiasm, incredible, incredible willingness to actually take a hit for curlews um, and you can work with keepers to say okay the curlews are over here you know can you do some predator control over here the problem with this is that this is this is there's only so much uh, mileage in these sorts of approaches where you're relying on goodwill farmers have to make a living keeping keepering costs a lot of money so these are these are solutions that have been you know i guess surprisingly successful but they're not really the answer and then for some of these populations, as, as I've um, described, some of these populations in the south are absolutely on their last legs and it's emergency measures time. So we've got these nest fences that have been piloted in Germany, Curlew country started rolling them out in Shropshire, we're trying them in the Seven Vale. They do work uh, to keep out terrestrial predators, uh, foxes, badgers, and um, well, foxes and badgers basically. Um, and of course, that isn't all the predators we've got to worry about, and it doesn't protect the chicks. The chicks are out of there within a day or two. But it can just put a boost on productivity, so it can be a help. And then I suppose the kind of the, the, the gold-plated uh, emergency action is head starting. It's very intensive. It's very expensive. Uh, it does provide a really big boost to the output of your curly population. It buys you some time, buys you a decade try and sort out these bigger problems. So 
we've got these these, these tools um, that I've just described, and you know we may be able to hold the line for these remaining global populations, but to be honest, they're nearly all currently still declining. So what we really need here is is policy that promotes curly friendly farming, curly friendly land management, and this means lots and lots of acronyms. It means the new environmental land management scheme above all, nature recovery networks, biodiversity net gain, the Nature for Climate Fund. We need all these things to come together. We need them to work for farmers and land managers who want to protect curlews. So how do we, as the Curly Recovery Partnership, how do, how do we at the WWT, how do we make that happen? Well, lobby, 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 advocate, advocate, advocate. So the door is open. Um, the curlew is one of the very few species named checked in the 25 year plan for the environment. Um, so, you know, we've got an open door, but we've also got to remember it's not just about the curlews, okay? It's not the curlew, stupid. Um, they're the flagship, but the message we've got to get across and the evidence we've got to get across to DEFRA is that curlew friendly farming is also good for carbon storage, it's also good for soil health. It can be good for flood regulation. It can be good for pollinators and, and, and insect um, decline. And it can be good for human well-being. Um, and we need to make that case and we need to make that case in spades. And there are some great partners already working on some of the sort of the bits off at a tangent. I know, again, I'm probably stealing Mandy's thunder. Mandy Perkins has been looking at some of the economics around what curly friendly farming would look like. Floodplain Meadows Partnership, um, who we've just started working with, are looking at how much carbon Play Meadows store. Um, there's lots of work going on in this area. So we need ELMS, environmental land management. We need it to be really good. And we already know lots of stuff about what we need for curlews. Sam's talked about it, Mary talked about it, I've talked about it. But there is actually a lot we don't know, a lot that we can improve and refine about the prescriptions for curlew management. Um, and you have to remember that it, it Environment, that agri-environment subsidies cost taxpayers money and they cost a lot of land managers time and so we have to get this right it's to our advantage if we can make it really cheap and really efficient to farm in a curly friendly way and that's why I always argue and I would argue this because I'm a researcher but more research is needed so you know one of the big questions why have we got so many predators Sam mentioned this we know that the UK has some of the highest predator densities in the country. We know that they're increasing. Right now, we know we need some combinations, depending on your site, of lethal control, fencing, head starting, you know, but these are expensive sticking plasters. How do we manage land to make it less favourable? We need big research programmes on this. This is a really fundamental problem for the British countryside. It's not just about curlews. It's about all sorts of weight. It's, it's about hares, it's about stone curlews. It's about loads of stuff that is suffering from this overabundance of generalist predators. And there's a lot of subtlety in it. So there's, there's various theories going around about is it to do with urban development and the foxes all get their food from the country, from the towns and then spill out into the countryside? Is it about game bird release? The bottom line is we don't really know. And so what we need is new research to answer these questions. There's also a lot of subtleties around the predator issue that we don't yet fully understand. So there's some increasing evidence that if you control one predator pretty effectively, you can just get compensatory increases in other predators which is really quite a depressing thought. Um, there's also sort of ecological stuff going on. A lot of these predators, so your buzzards, your kites, your foxes, your badgers, they actually eat an awful lot of earthworms. What happens when we get a dry spell like this? No earthworms. Is that what prompts them to go and start heading for the, for the damper areas and munching waders? We know that in different sites and in different years, the predator suite is different. So some places it's predominantly crows that do the predation, some places predominantly foxes, somewhere something different. We don't know why and we can't predict it, but that really has an effect on how you would manage, how you do lethal control. We've said it needs to be proportionate and justified. You need to know what your predators are. So there's lots and lots of work to be done on this really big issue. One of the things I'm quite interested in is, is are there ways to get grassland mowing better for curlews and for wildlife more generally. So if you think back in the day, little little chuggy tractors that, you know, were like children's toys, they mowed slowly, they mowed it patchily, you know, one field at a time over a period of, of weeks. Uh, now you get entire landscapes cleared of grass over the space of a few days by very large, very rapid machines. 
Does anyone know what difference that makes to things like insect populations? Did there used to be patches of refugia for insects, which then recolonized? Um, the, the patches of, of recently cut grass and long grass that was a sort of food mosaic? I don't think we really know much about that. Um, I don't think we know if there's a way to mow in a more curly friendly fashion. Um, I do know that um, you know, farming, modern farming technology is spectacularly advanced. So my father-in-law had a tractor which could detect nitrate levels in his crop as he drove over it. Why can't we have a tractor that detects an oncoming whaler nest? Um, I, the answer is we can, if somebody's willing to pay for the R&D. And are there subtleties to how we get this food rich, extensive grassland? Um, how much insects is enough? Um, I, I really agree with what Sam was saying about, you know, there's strong suspicion that if you've got an insect rich habitat, the chicks are less likely to get predated because they spend less time being active in vulnerable places if they've got more food. So how do, how do we get that right? Is it all about putting more water back in the landscape? There's a lot of work that we've been doing at the Wild Final Wetlands Trust about how wetlands kind of subsidize the surrounding terrestrial areas. They export insects. And so is it about putting ponds and foot drains and boggy corners back in fields? Is that what's gonna make this happen? Or is it all about this stuff and um, dung and the parasitize that we've put into cattle, which means that dung is now no longer a great source of insects in large parts of the country. Is it all about getting getting dung back alive again, um, as, as the folk at Nepcastle and rewilding types often say? So I guess that's a whistle-stop tour. The lowlands is a big problem. There's lots of stuff going on already. There's lots of exciting stuff we can do in the future around getting the policy right, but also around more answers, better answers to how we get curly friendly farming. How do we do all this? Um, WWT is doing lots of research in the Seven Vale. It's almost like our, our laboratory for, for trying to learn how you get curly conservation right. Lots of other people are doing similar stuff on their patches. Many of them are in the, in the call tonight. And I guess what's brilliant about the Curly Recovery Partnership is it gives us that opportunity to pool the data across the lowlands and find common answers. And as, an, as a scientist, that's incredibly exciting because the power of pooling data from 10 or more projects um, is, is enormous. Our ability to answer these key questions becomes uh, in a, an order of magnitude better. So that's it from me. I've probably run over by miles as usual. Sorry about that. <laughs>